Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. Grace teaches you to live a godly life. A person that says, well, man, I'm into the grace of God, and so now it doesn't matter how I live. And so they go around and they treat people badly and they lie and steal and don't care if they ever go to church. It doesn't matter if you study the Word. It doesn't matter what you do because it's all the grace of God. You hadn't got hold of God's grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Thursday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Once again, I'm teaching verse by verse through the book of Romans. We're now into Romans chapter 13 and beginning with verse 11. I've been doing this for 10 weeks now, and we've still got a couple of more chapters to go. And so this has been a lengthy process, but I tell you, I've really enjoyed it. And the things that I've been teaching here are just profound. This applies to our situation today, just like Paul wrote this in our day. And it's amazing how many things we see in our culture today that are happening that are completely contrary to what is being said right here in the book of Romans. If not only the unbelievers, but if Christians knew what the Word of God taught, it would radically change their behavior. But we've got some evil elements that are trying to cause anarchy, and disruption. I mean, it's a playbook right out of the Communist Manifesto, manifesto where they say you got to go in and create this instability and crisis to where the people will be willing to give up freedoms in order to uh, return back to security. And that's what's happening. And some people know exactly what they're doing. The people who are behind all of this know exactly what they're doing, but I really believe there are a... It couldn't happen. Let me say it this way. There are not enough people who are sold on Marxism and socialism to make this happen. They are taking advantage of people that don't know what Marxism and socialism is all about, and they are getting them to participate, thinking they're doing something noble, and it's not at all. It's just like this... Equality Act that they are trying to pass here in the United States. It's an inequality act. It's the End of Freedom Act is what it is. And they name it, and there's people that jump on board not knowing what it is. And if they just knew what the Word of God said, then they wouldn't be doing these things. So anyway, I'm really excited about this teaching. This is... It applies to us today. And it's right where we are. And I'm just praying that some of you watching this, I'm not saying any of the things that I'm saying to hurt people, to condemn you, but rather to open up your eyes that Satan is just trying to take advantage of people and people are being sucked in because they don't know the truth. Over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it says, "...because people did not receive a love of the truth..." Therefore, they will have this strong delusion that they will believe a lie. And that's what's happening in our day and age today. People are being sucked into these evil lifestyles and evil things. And some of them are even Christians because they don't have a love of the truth. Jesus said, God's Word is truth. John 17, 17. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. They don't truly love God and they don't love His Word. And so what we're doing by going verse by verse, we're dealing with a lot of things that normally I wouldn't talk about, but they're really good. So we're now in Romans chapter 13. And let me just back up and read verse 10 again because it's the uh, conclusion of some things he had just said in the previous verses. In verse 10 it says, Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. And I'm not going to take time to go back, but especially in Romans chapter 12, verse 9, I talked about let your love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. True God kind of love hates evil. Not the evil people, not the people that are doing the evil, but you hate evil and you cleave to that which is good. Today, when people are preaching love and they're saying love is love, regardless whether it's between two men or two women or between a man and a dog or whatever, that's not true. 
THAT'S NOT GOD'S KIND OF LOVE. THAT IS EVIL. IT'S SENSUAL. IT'S DEVILISH. AND IT DESTROYS PEOPLE'S LIVES. AND GOD'S KIND OF LOVE WILL SPEAK THE TRUTH IN LOVE. EPHESIANS CHAPTER 4 AND VERSE 15, I BELIEVE, SAYS, SPEAK THE TRUTH IN LOVE. YOU DON'T JUST SPEAK THE TRUTH AND YOU DON'T JUST TALK ABOUT LOVE. YOU SPEAK THE TRUTH IN LOVE. AND THAT'S WHAT CAUSES US TO GROW UP IN MATURITY. IN VERSE 11, IT SAYS, AND THAT KNOWING THE TIME THAT NOW IT IS HIGH TIME TO AWAKE OUT OF SLEEP, FOR NOW IS OUR SALVATION NEARER THAN WHEN WE BELIEVED. THE NIGHT IS FAR SPENT. THE DAY IS AT HAND. LET US THEREFORE CAST OFF THE WORKS OF DARKNESS AND LET US PUT ON THE ARMOR OF LIGHT. MAN, THIS WAS WRITTEN OVER 2,000 YEARS AGO, AND PAUL WAS TALKING ABOUT THAT IT'S GETTING CLOSE. It's, IT'S GETTING TOWARDS THE END TIMES. In the, ON THE DAY OF PENTECOST, Paul, uh, PETER GOT UP AND HE QUOTED JOEL AND HE TALKED ABOUT IN THE LAST DAYS THIS WOULD HAPPEN, THE OUTPOURING OF THE HOLY SPIRIT. AND THAT WAS THE BEGINNING OF THE LAST DAYS 2,000 YEARS AGO. IF 2,000 YEARS AGO WAS THE LAST DAYS, THEN WE HAVE TO BE IN THE LAST OF THE LAST DAYS. I MEAN, WE'RE DOWN TO THE LAST SECONDS. THINGS ARE WINDING DOWN AND WE NEED TO KEEP THIS IN MIND. YOU KNOW, ONE OF THE REASONS I THINK THAT CHRISTIANS HAVE BEEN COMPLACENT AND has, HAVE ALLOWED THE UNGODLY TO GAIN THE UPPER HAND IN SOME AREAS THAT THEY HAVE IS BECAUSE CHRISTIANS ARE THINKING ABOUT ETERNITY AND THEY ARE ENJOYING THEIR PERSONAL RELATIONSHIP WITH GOD AND SO TO A DEGREE THEY AREN'T LIMITED TO JUST THIS PHYSICAL WORLD. BUT THE UNGODLY, THEY DON'T BELIEVE IN A FUTURE. AND THEY DON'T HAVE ANYTHING EXCEPT THIS RIGHT HERE. AND SO THEREFORE, THEY'RE MORE FOCUSED ON DEALING WITH THINGS IN THE NATION, AND THEY DON'T HAVE A PERSONAL RELATIONSHIP WITH GOD, AND SO THEREFORE, THEY HAVE TO FIND THEIR IDENTITY IN THE COLLECTIVE, AND THEY GO OUT HERE, AND and THEY'VE GOT TO IDENTIFY AND DO ALL OF THESE THINGS. SO CHRISTIANS, IN A SENSE, HAVE BEEN uh, INSULATED FROM THIS, BUT MAN, WE NEED TO RECOGNIZE IT'S THE LAST TIME. AND THE SCRIPTURE SHOWS US CLEARLY THAT IN THE LAST DAYS, WE ARE GOING TO HAVE THE ANTICHRIST COME. THERE'S GOING TO BE TERRIBLE THINGS HAPPEN. AND WE HAVE TO STAND UP AND RESIST THIS. THOSE WHO ARE IN THE BODY OF CHRIST ARE THE THING THAT IS HINDERING SATAN. AND WE NEED TO STAND UP AND STOP HIM IN HIS TRACKS. AND SO IN VERSE 13, LET US WALK HONESTLY AS IN THE DAY THIS IS TALKING ABOUT, YOU KNOW, JESUS TALKED ABOUT IN THE THIRD CHAPTER OF THE BOOK OF JOHN THAT THOSE WHO DO EVIL DO IT IN THE NIGHT SO THAT THEIR DEEDS WILL BE HIDDEN. THEY DON'T WANT TO COME TO THE LIGHT BECAUSE THEY WOULD BE EXPOSED. AND SO THEY WANT TO DO IT COVERTLY. THEY WANT TO DO IT IN SECRET AND HIDE THEMSELVES. THIS IS SAYING THAT WE OUGHT TO BE OF THE DAY. WE NEED TO WALK HONESTLY AS IN THE DAY, NOT IN RIOTING AND DRUNKENNESS. AGAIN, IF PEOPLE WERE TO READ THIS, CHRISTIANS WOULD HAVE NEVER HAVE PARTICIPATED IN RIOTING WHERE THEY COME IN AND LOOT AND BURN AND HURT PEOPLE AND KILL POLICEMEN AND DO ALL THIS KIND OF STUFF. THIS IS COMPLETELY CONTRARY TO WHAT GOD'S WORD SAYS. THERE IS A RIGHT AND A WRONG WAY TO PROTEST, AND IN OUR AMERICAN SYSTEM OF GOVERNMENT, WE HAVE WAYS THAT WE CAN CHANGE THE SYSTEM AND WE CAN DEAL WITH IT BASED ON OUR CONSTITUTIONAL RIGHTS. RIOTING IS NOT THE WAY TO DO THINGS. I WOULD SUSPECT THAT THE MAJORITY OF PEOPLE WATCHING THIS PROGRAM WOULD AGREE WITH THAT, AND YET MANY OF YOU THAT WOULD AGREE WOULD SAY, WELL, I I AGREE. I WOULDN'T PERSONALLY GO OUT AND WRITE, BUT I WOULD NEVER SAY ANYTHING TO THOSE WHO DO. WELL, WE SHOULD. IT'S AN UNGODLY THING, AND IT GIVES PLACE TO THE DEVIL. SATAN IS BEHIND ALL OF THESE RIGHTS, THE LOOTING AND THE BURNING. THIS WAS NOT GODLY. IT IS CONTRARY TO EVERYTHING TALKED ABOUT RIGHT HERE IN ROMANS CHAPTER 13. SO HE SAYS AGAIN IN VERSE 13, LET US WALK HONESTLY AS IN THE DAY, NOT IN RIOTING AND DRUNKENNESS, NOT IN CHAMBERING. YOU KNOW, uh, I'M NOT GOING TO GO INTO GREAT DETAIL ON THIS, BUT IF YOU LOOK UP THAT WORD, IN THE GREEK, IT LITERALLY TALKS ABOUT THE MALE SPERM IS WHAT IT'S TALKING ABOUT. IT'S TALKING ABOUT IMMORALITY. AND MOST OF THE MODERN uh, TRANSLATIONS, THIS IS WHAT IT'S TALKING ABOUT. SO WE SHOULD NOT BE WALKING IN RIOTING, DRUNKENNESS, IN IMMORALITY, AND WANTONNESS. WANTONNESS IS JUST TO WHERE THERE IS NO RESTRAINT, NO LIMITS ON WHAT YOU WILL DO. YOU JUST DO WHATEVER YOU WANT TO. 
And that's where our society is pushing to go. They're talking about homosexuality. They're talking about transgenderism. There's even people that have advocated bestiality. There's people that are advocating uh, polygamy and just on and on. There's no restraints. They're wanting to make to wear whatever a person wants to do. It's just free for them to do anything that they want to do. That's what the Bible calls wantonness, and it says don't do that. Nor in strife and envying. James chapter 3, verse 16 says, Where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Not some evil work, every evil work. When you have strife and envy, it opens up a door to anything the devil wants to do. And back during these riots that we experienced in 2020, boy, envy is a thing. People were saying it's not fair. We want to take from the rich and give to the poor. You know what that is? That's covetousness. That's envy. That's wrong. You do not have the right to go to a person who has more and take it from them. That's envy. It's covetousness. And the strife that we see where people are just hating and saying that, you know, we need to come against this group and it's identity politics where they're trying to put everybody into a group and say that all white people are prejudiced, whether you know it or not. That's just as wrong as saying that all black people are wrong. That's not right. It's not the color of the skin. It's sin. It's just human nature. There's good white people. There's good black people. There's good... There's evil white people and there's evil black people. It is not a black and white issue. It's a sin issue. And wantonness and drunkenness and immorality and rioting lead to all of these kind of things. And where envy and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. I tell you, the division that's in our nation has been stoked. It has been amplified by all of the ungodly factors, and it is opening up a door to every evil work. Man, there's much, much, much more I could say about that. In verse 14, it says, But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. When this is talking about the flesh, it's not talking about your physical body. It's talking about the carnal part of you, not your spiritual man, but just living in wantonness, drunkenness, immorality, riots, all of these kind of things. It says don't make provision for that. Don't plan on that kind of stuff. There are so many people that their whole life is just built around themselves and satisfying their own things instead of being spiritual to where they love God first and they love other people second. We should put God and other people ahead of ourselves. So we should not be making provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust and the desires of it. In chapter 14, verse 1, it says, Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. Again, this is King James. This is Old English. But what this is saying is you need... This is talking about brothers in the Lord. This is talking about among Christians that we are supposed to receive our brothers and sisters in the Lord, but not in a way where we sit there and we, we pounce on them for their belief systems and because they aren't strong in some area, we criticize them. This is preaching that we need to look beyond people's faults and things that we disagree with and we need to find some common ground with them. In verse 2, it says, For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. You know, to some people this means nothing today, but in the day that this was written, there were people that offered sacrifices to idols, and they would put meat offerings, and they would offer them to idols. And then after they offered it to the idol, of course the idol didn't eat it because their idol is nothing. There wasn't any deity there, no power there. And so the meat, after it was offered, they would take this meat and they would go to the market and they'd sell it. And some people paid premium for this meat because it had been offered unto a deity. But this put the Christians in an awkward situation because some of them liked that meat 
And yet others saw it as this is meat that's been offered to an idol. And if you eat this, well, then you're participating in idolatry. Paul wrote about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 all the way through chapter 11. There's a lot that was written on it. Also in Acts chapter 15, there was an entire conference that they came together and they dealt with this issue of eating meat that had been sacrificed to idols. And the thrust of it is, I'm just summarizing here, but Paul said that an idol is nothing. It's just stone or wood. It's something that man made. There is no deity in it. There is no God except one. So technically speaking, there's nothing wrong with this meat. Technically speaking, it's just meat and you could eat it the same as you eat any other meat. But then he says, not everybody sees it that way. And some people who have a weak conscience see you go get this meat that has been offered unto idols and you eat it and it emboldens them. And they think, well, then I can eat this meat that's been sacrificed to idols. And you see it as just meat, but they see it as participating in idolatry. You're encouraging them. And he says, by doing so, you're wounding their weak conscience. And, and the very last verse of this 14th chapter, I'm not going to have time to get there today, but in the last verse of this 14th chapter, he basically comes down and he says, if you wound a person like that and they eat not of faith, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And they're eating and drinking damnation to themselves because they think that they are participating in idolatry. So he's saying it's not just about what's right. It's about your weak brother. And when you receive them into your number, take into account what they believe. You know, here's a modern example of this that I had a friend of mine who he believed that it was okay to have a glass of wine with a meal. And I believe that technically that is true. Some people who are total teetotalers, which let me just say that I've never taken a drink of liquor in my life. I've never tasted alcohol of any kind. I've never had a beer. I've never done that in all of my 72 years. So I am not advocating drinking wine or stuff like that. But scripturally speaking, I believe that Jesus turned the water into wine and it was fermented wine. It wasn't just grape juice. I don't think that scripturally it is wrong to have a glass of wine. What's wrong is when you get drunk. And personally, if this is the line and anything beyond that is wrong, well, I'm not going to get right up to it and see how much I can drink before I get drunk. I'm just going to stay here and never drink. And I'll guarantee you I'll never get drunk. That's the way I'm approaching it. That's the way I would recommend it's done by other people. But uh, I'm aware that not everybody feels that way. And so let's say that somebody has the revelation that you can drink wine with your meal and it's no problem. But then somebody else comes in who thinks that, man, if you have a glass of wine, you go straight to hell. Well, that's probably not correct. That's not correct based on the Word of God. But nonetheless, if that's what they believe and they see you drinking wine, it's going to embolden them and they go out and start getting drunk and they have all of these problems. And in a sense, you caused it. Now, there's a balance here. This doesn't mean that we just have to live our life totally in fear of other people, but it does mean that we need to take that into account. And I had a friend of mine who went to a church and he believed he could have wine with his meal. And the pastor of the church knew that. And he took all of the youth out to eat. And the pastor of the church asked him specifically, please don't have wine in front of these kids. We don't want to encourage that. Well, the man just went ahead and had wine. He had a, a beer, I think it was, in front of these other kids and encouraged them to drink it. And man, it went out that the youth went out with this guy and were drinking and it caused a lot of problems. I think that was the wrong thing. Even though technically he didn't do anything that was sin, it was not wisdom. It wasn't honoring the other person's conscience. And this is what he's talking about right here. He said that there were some people who had the truth and they knew that by eating meat sacrificed to an idol, there was nothing wrong with it. But there was other people who saw it as idolatry. And if they received them and don't take into account their weak conscience, how that they hadn't had their conscience renewed, then they were going to be the one who was, was an instrument of leading this person into idolatry, to embrace idolatry, because the way they saw it, that's what that person was doing. 
And he says, don't do things like that. You need to take into account the other person's conscience. In verse 4, it says, Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, you may be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. You know, you could apply this to a number of things today, but there are some denominations that teach that we have to observe the Sabbath from sundown Friday until sundown Saturday. Other people believe that the Sabbath is Sunday. Technically speaking, the Sabbath is sundown Friday until sundown Saturday, but in the New Covenant, we don't have this Sabbath uh, the way it was observed in the Old Testament Hebrews chapter 4 says we live in a Sabbath rest and we don't have to observe every day as a Sabbath. Matter of fact, I believe this is why the church chose to meet on Sunday to just make a clean break from the Old Testament law and all of the restrictions that were identified with the Sabbath. But he's saying that some people esteem one day alike, others esteem uh, other certain days more important than others. And he says, don't sit there and judge the other person. It goes on to say, he that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth unto himself, and no man dieth unto himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or whether we die, we are the Lord's. And so he's basically saying that these aren't things that you should make a major issue of. Go back to the first verse. We need to receive others, but not to pounce on their doubts and, and cause this conflict and make doctrine the biggest issue. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying that doctrine isn't important. There are some doctrinal issues, such as Jesus is the only way unto the Father. You have to put faith in Him and not faith in yourself. And there are some things that this same person who wrote these things wrote in Galatians chapter 1, if any man preaches another gospel unto you than that which I have preached, let him be accursed. There are some things that are non-negotiable but a lot of our religious things are not that big of a deal. You know, such as baptism. The, the actual word baptizo in the Greek means to immerse. And so the Bible literally teaches that baptism is totally submersing a person. But during the time that the Bible was translated, they were into sprinkling. And rather than upset the whole apple cart. They didn't translate this as immerse a person. They just said baptizo. They made up a word. They took baptizo and turned it into baptize so that nobody knew exactly what it meant and they could either dunk or sprinkle or whatever. Now, I have an opinion based on what the real Greek says, but you know, the way I look at it is you just hold them under until they totally repent. <laughs> Amen. So I'm not going to fight over Water baptism. Some people believe you got to be water baptized to be saved. Now, I will stand and fight over that because that's saying that you have to add something else to what Jesus did. But as a whole, there are so much religious doctrines. We just need to get beyond it is what these verses are saying. I'm out of time, but please listen to our announcer as he tells you how to get this book, a brand new book that we're offering during this series. And we've also got a lot of other materials. He'll give you all of the information and then please call or write today and receive these products. I would like to encourage you to check out our social media, all of these different platforms. We've got a lot of good news to share, so check it out, our social media for Andrew Womack Ministries. Andrew is pleased to announce the release of his brand new hardback book titled Romans, Paul's Masterpiece on Grace. This brand new book includes all of Andrew's personal study notes and commentary on the book of Romans, compiled from Andrew's Life for Today Study Bible and Living Commentary. This valuable resource is available for a gift of any amount when you contact us. 
Romans, Paul's masterpiece on grace, is also available in a CD or DVD album made from our daily television broadcast. Each of these valuable resources are available for a gift of any amount when you contact us. This entire series is also available for audio download absolutely free from our website. Go to awmi.net to see all the ways you can get this teaching. Today, you heard Andrew's personal revelation on the book of Romans. You can study through the entire Bible with Andrew when you get his continually updated living commentary. This extraordinary resource contains his personal study notes, footnotes, and commentary on over 25,000 Bible verses. Andrew has priced this valuable study tool at only $120. Go to awmi.net to download yours today. Also today, Andrew's offering the Grace Encounters Volumes 1 and 2 DVDs as his free gift to you when you write or call. This special offer is a $50 value, absolutely free when you contact us today. Or you can get each of these valuable resources as part of the Romans package. This package includes Andrew's living commentary, as well as the Romans, Paul's masterpiece on grace, hardback book, your choice of either the CD or DVD album, and Grace Encounters Volumes 1 and 2 DVDs. This incredible package has a catalog value of $275, but you can receive all of these valuable resources today for just $197. We want to say a special thank you to the Grace Partners of Andrew Womack Ministries. Your gifts make it possible to put free ministry materials into the hands of many people in need. If you're not already a Grace Partner, we ask you to pray about becoming one today. You can become a Grace Partner or order resources through our website at awmi.net. While there, you can discover more product details and download additional free resources. You can also order resources or receive prayer by calling our helpline at 719-635-1111. Our helpline is open Monday through Friday, 24 hours a day, and Saturday and Sunday from 7.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. Mountain Time. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. We'd like to point out Andrew's upcoming speaking schedule. Mark your calendars to come meet Andrew at one of these events and let the Word of God transform your life. In the month of September, come to Woodland Park for the Destiny Conference with guest speaker Dwayne Sheriff. Then, Andrew will be speaking in Camp Hill, Pennsylvania. And in October, Andrew will be hosting live stream events to Zimbabwe and Uganda. Next, Andrew will be speaking in Colorado Springs. Then come to Woodland Park for the annual Minister's Conference with speakers Andrew Womack, Bob Nichols, Bob Yandian, Carrie Pickett, Greg Moore, Dwayne Sheriff, and Jesse Duplantis. Lastly, in October, join us for the Women Arise Conference. Please note, Andrew will not be speaking at this event. For more details on Andrew's next meeting in your area, visit our website at awmi.net.